just kind of wanted to try that Asia, they had some good programs in Asia, but never been a big focus for the organization. So they have been working on an Africa strategy, which was obviously a really key continent for the business. And I thought, okay, well, why don't I, there's not much going on in Asia. Maybe it's something I can try my hand at. Let's put together a kind of Asia strategy. Maybe no one will ever, will, will ever look at it, but let's see where it goes. And then, so I pulled that together. It actually ended up being pretty well received. But, but I think the key thing at that time was that the awards ended up taking place in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, which was the first time the awards, the World Sports Awards had happened there. And so suddenly there was a big focus for the business on Asia. And luckily I, I pulled together this, this strategy, which meant that I could be kind of relatively involved in terms of some of the, the social responsibility work and the, the sport for good work that we would do kind of around the awards. The awards were in, in KL in 2014, I think, and then Shanghai in 2015 in, in China. And so spent a lot of time out in those countries, kind of building out some of our programs, working with Mercedes-Benz in some of those countries. From Coordinate Sports, it's The Drive Phase, a show about sports founders, leaders, and experts, and the stories behind their business journeys. This episode, I'm joined by Will Stone, the head of CSR strategy at the NFL. Will's career is a travel bucket list that has led him to work on projects across 50 countries. Initially influenced by a gap year coaching in Cairo and Mozambique, he found his passion for sport for development and went on to work at Laureus as they launched into Asia. We discussed the vision for the NFL in the UK, moving from simply hosting games to a year-round strategy for developing the sport across the country, as well as Will's approach to leading with empathy. Enjoy the show. So I'm really excited to welcome Will Stone, the head of CSR strategy at the NFL, uh, onto the show today. He's actually responsible for the NFL CSR impact in the UK and also advancing the NFL Academy initiative. So welcome to the show, Will. Thanks, James. Great to, great to be here. Yeah, no, I've been, look, I've been uh, looking forward to speaking to you, uh, specifically around um, NFL and the bigger, like it's longer term plans. But I mean, before we get into that, really want to get to uh, get to know you a bit more and kind of understand where you, where you come from, really. So what's your background and I guess early sporting memories where we start? or whether that be in school or just a, a club situation what would that be for you sure it's, it's difficult to kind of pinpoint one specifically because I think sport's just been a part of my life growing up my father particularly is very very sporty uh, big Arsenal fan season ticket holders going back to, to his dad so long time and then my mum is always worked with horses works in the kind of equestrian kind of kind of world training and, and teaching so sport has always been a part of my life I think probably earliest sort of memories I guess kind of just playing football on a Saturday morning with friends at a local local club you know every Saturday morning getting very very muddy having very muddy baths off afterwards but you know just throwing myself around and good time with mates really would be kind of the earliest earliest one that I could probably pinpoint I think yeah just the enjoyment of it that's what I guess that's hopefully where we all started with it so you grew up it's like Surrey Hampshire border area yeah right? exactly a town, town called town called Hazelmere on the Surrey Hampshire border quite quite a small town very kind of middle class England kind of uh, bringing went to uh, a local state school had a lot of fun you know a nice very nice upbringing there was nothing particularly remarkable about it I don't think it was pretty privileged position uh pretty white kind of schools so there wasn't a lot of diversity or any anything like that but it was uh you know it was a very nice kind of upbringing and uh and an enjoyable time really and then with that I guess obviously parents being sports fans and, and obviously the mum being into a question was I guess the family environment was, was sporty active lifestyle kind of embedded within it yeah absolutely you know there was always Always sport on TV, we're at home, always out and about. Although I did take me until the age of nine to be able to ride a bike, so I was pretty shocking from that perspective. But we were out, <laughs> out and about, and uh, you know, w- walking around, attempting to, to ride horses, although doing a pretty bad, doing a pretty bad job of it. And yeah, it was pretty outdoorsy, and and yeah, sport was always kind of a big part of it, really. Yeah, and I guess like I said, moving through school, etc. You you went on before for uni, so I've got kind of gap year experience. Yeah, and I know sport was like a big part in that, which potentially might have led you down a different path if you didn't follow follow that one I suppose certainly yeah I mean I have no idea what I would be doing now if I hadn't taken the gap year that I did so I ended up plan was to do the sort of Australia Southeast Asia kind of uh, classic tour yeah. with, with a couple of friends and ended up seeing an opportunity that, that Arsenal were running they, they started this a gap, community gap year program which they'd, they'd not done before this was in 2006 when they the first year they moved to the Emirates Stadium and so thought could be interesting to do something a little, little bit different always loved football not done any coaching before but just thought be an interesting thing and then the real kind of appeal of it was half of it was based in North London kind of in local schools and working in some of the community programs that the club was was running there and then the other half would be an international placement at one of their international soccer schools and so I had definitely wanted to travel that had always been kind of the ambition for for the year I guess but I thought just would be something a little bit different and you know to be part of 
being a big Arsenal fan growing up to be around the stadium and kind of around the club was a kind of a really appealing, obviously really appealing kind of opportunity really. So I applied for that, managed to get onto that programme. That sounds like I'm mean, pretty pioneering um, program to be fair I don't know if it, that time 2005-06 whether it was uh, stand out as Arsenal the like, pioneers with that, that type of um, I guess gap yeah, and definitely attractive for, for an 18 19 year old to, to be able to, to be able to travel yeah um, absolutely. I, mean, I, I don't know if, if other clubs are taking on it's still, still something the club run they have I think about 20 different uh, young, young people you know some before uni some after some actually just wanting a change of career who, who take part in it but it's yeah it's a really great initiative and it's, it's led to a lot of a lot of people getting involved in the, in the game I think in the world of sport I think so and that was your gap year ended up you were in Cairo was that Cairo yeah I was in Cairo so I mean already the first half in sort of in, in North London was a very different experience to what I'd had in, in growing up in Surrey you know much more much more diverse uh, people around young people in the schools and the students in the schools and it was great fun it was a really interesting experience I did my level one coaching badges and and, and so forth and then yeah when was sent out to Cairo for four months which was a really really kind of eye-opening experience particularly and you know I'd never I've traveled around Europe a little bit into the US but never really spent much time in a in a country that was just a totally different culture to to what we have over here and just absolutely loved the experience of just learning about a different way of life, meeting different people, what, learning from the other coaches in the in the soccer school there. I mean, I, to be honest, I think my coaching is, I've never been a great coach, but it's kind of led me into doing lots of different things. And the, the coaching was fun, but it was kind of a way of, of me kind of just getting to know different people and experiencing different ways of, of living, I think, which was which was something that I really, really took from that. So I guess, I guess I was always ask, I was, I'm curious of kind of the spark for, for wanting to get into and make your career around sport for intent, sport for good, etc. Was that that experience of going from, like you said, sorry, suburb, like kind of kind of small town life into North London and working in those communities, even before you travelled, did that give you a spark to be like, right, this is kind of what I want to do for the rest of my career? Or is that, is that where you found it at that point? I think the spark came a little bit, a little bit later on. I think it was interesting to know that sport was there as an opportunity and, and there was that coaching element, but I don't think I ever fell in love enough of coaching to want to pursue the coaching element as, as a career. I think probably where the spark came was actually the following summer, 2008, Dove and a friend who I met on that program went back to the club and said, we'd, we'd love to go on another placement during our summer holidays. Could we, you know, where where could we go? We're, we'd like to go somewhere a bit, a, bit, a bit different. And they ended up connecting us with a small club and a small Sport for Good program actually in, in Mozambique, in rural Mozambique, in a town called um, Manica, which is just on a sort of central Mozambique near the border of, of Zimbabwe. They'd never sent anyone out there before. It was kind of totally on, on us, but we we uh, connected with a, a guy called Skog Van Heerden, and he's a, you know, been a bit of a pioneer for some of these programs in, in Southern Africa, I think, and still does a lot of work in this space. And he took us up there. We we stayed, I think, for about six to eight weeks in, in Manica. And that was really the first time that I'd seen sport being used as a way to, to impact social create social change within a community so the players who they had a kind of I think they were a second division team in, in Mozambique but the players all had to give back as part of their role so they would run coaching sessions for local kids this is a really small town I'm not sure exactly what the population but it was a pretty remote fairly remote place uh, but they also had a computer school they had you know they were teaching English they were teaching Portuguese teaching IT and they kind of the whole club although for sport was also a real kind of community learning center in a way of, of impacting positive change within that community in, in Mozambique and providing opportunities for the people within that town. So that was the first time that I had I'd really come across Sport for Good. And it happened that that program was supported by Laureus Sport for Good. And that was kind of my first understanding that there is an organization up there that actually does this. That's their that's their role is to provide support for these types of programs. So that was mm -hmm. kind of the first time that my eyes really opened to the idea that this could be something I want to pursue a bit more, a bit more longer term. Yeah, I mean, on the ground as well, so that your first trip to Africa, et cetera, in terms of the second of, of Cairo, but in terms of, I guess, culture and language, I don't know if you speak much, I was in Mozambique, so we put, I guess, Portuguese. Portuguese, again, yeah, yeah you, picked up a few words, words but, but not a lot. I mean, the proximity to Zimbabwe helped because there was a lot of English speakers speak, yeah, um, exactly. there from Zimbabwe. But no, I mean, it was a total landing in the middle of a totally different lifestyle and, and experience. You know, even Cairo is still, you know, it's a very built built up city that's it's pretty modern in terms of things that's there whereas Manika was very much a developing location very very rural and entirely different to anywhere I'd, I'd been before. That impact from that trip obviously is going to be sitting with you to go back to the university and complete your studies etc what and what did you study at uni sorry I, forgot. I did politics yeah 
So right, so you st studying politics, and then did that shape, obviously, assuming we, when you chose to study politics, maybe this wasn't in your no, thought, pro no. thought process of getting into getting into the industry that way. So was that a big a big decision you wrestled with at that point to be that way? Is this really what I want to be? Yeah, I mean, I think the thing with politics is that I was interested in it, and it wouldn't define a career for me necessarily at the end of it. So it was, I guess it was a bit of a cop out in some in some ways of just not really knowing what what I wanted to do, but it was something that was that was interesting. So I don't think I would have, who knows, but I don't think I would have entered the world of, of politics. I think it's it's been interesting and it's definitely helped in terms of some of the roles I'm doing, particularly now. But I, I don't think a, a kind of full term. Yeah, you probably, probably need the diplomacy in your role right now, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and we know linking with governments and other other bodies is, is quite quite an important part of what I do now but yeah I don't think you know becoming an MP or or anything like that or a civil servant probably was what I wanted to do but you know who knows what, what it would have been if it wasn't for this um, type of work yeah exactly and what the future holds I guess as well maybe yeah, <laughs> so, yeah so if exactly. you're if you're um yeah so you're coming back from you've already made that connection with Laureus like over in project there in Monika you're coming back how did that kind of because obviously moved on to work at, at Laureus for a significant period of time. So how did that kind of get started? Are you just kind of chased after the project? Yeah, or? me being me being belligerent, I think, really. I think, you know, I, I had a... We, when we came back to, to London after that trip, and I guess lucky again that Laureus happened to be based in London, which meant we could go in and, and meet people. That's, I met a guy called Matoga Madonda who who works at Laureus and who was the project manager for, for some of the programmes, including this one in, in Manica. And talk, he just wanted to know how the trip was, what, what the programme was like, but talked to us a bit about what Laureus was all about, the athletes they had in involved the awards side of it and I kind of there and then sort of fell in love with the organization and really I think I remember speaking to my dad on the way on the train back to Sassari afterwards and saying I think this could be somewhere I want to work at, at some point so we went back to Mozambique the following following summer and then somehow I managed to convince my professor at, at uni to allow me to write my dissertation around around Loris and and convince Laureus that they would let me could I come into the office every couple of weeks for a couple of days to um you know to learn about the organization and, and do my research for the for this dissertation so yeah kind of managed to, to wing my way into, nice, into nice. being in the office we'll, we'll, we'll link the the dissertation into the show notes as well if anyone wants to go and have a re uh, it's, it's, uh, who knows where it is but it's it got a decent mark but i don't think it's going to be a particularly uh, not a page piece, turn, of, no. <laughs> piece of academia <laughs> you've been doing the the work experience at that point and, and writing the, uh, and finishing off the dissertation etc so really inspirational it's difficult to kind of um not talk too much about Laureus. and we've got adam fraser coming up on the, on the show soon so I'm trying to avoid that but it's, it's such an amazing organization for yourself what was your role over there then in terms of that straight out of uni the entry level internship very or? yeah very much entry level level i think i was excuse me a program assistant when i first started so working on the grant side of things working with uh, some of the organizations that they were funding to help them in terms of i mean I don't think I was probably offering much help at that stage, but kind of learning from them and from my colleagues um, in terms of what, how they can spend the money, how to make them more sustainable, you know, making sure that being a good funder, I guess, they were getting the support they needed to do the work that, that they were doing. So I started very much on that side of things. And then as, as time went on, kind of tr transitioned more into a kind of development role with the organisation. Fantastic. And then I spent a good amount of time, there was maybe six, seven years at Loris and moving on to... I'm assuming you is it your dream job with being an Arsenal fan. Yeah, that... I mean, great. I mean, I had an amazing experience at, at Laureus, you know, travelled all over the world and ended up spending a lot of time in, particularly in Asia, a few months stints in China and, and Malaysia. But All right, so, um, yeah, so, yeah, sorry. Were you leading on the Asia, Asia work in, in the end, I guess, before you moved on? Yeah, I mean, at the, that was kind of, I guess, how I transitioned from that sort of grant side into the more the development side just kind of wanted to try that Asia, they had some good programs in Asia, but it'd never been a big focus for the organization. So they have been working on an Africa strategy, which was obviously a really key continent for the business. And I thought, okay, well, why don't I, there's not much going on in Asia. Maybe it's something I can try my hand at. Let's put together a kind of Asia strategy. Maybe no one will ever, will, will ever look at it, but let's see where it goes. And then, so I pulled that together. It actually ended up being pretty well received, but, but I think the key thing at that time was that the awards ended up taking place in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, which was the first time the awards, the World Sports Awards had happened there. And so suddenly there was a big focus for the business on Asia. And luckily I, I pulled together this, this strategy, which meant that I could be kind of relatively involved in terms of some of the, the social responsibility work and the, the sport for good work that we would do kind of around the awards. The awards were in, in KL in 2014, I think, and then Shanghai in 2015 in, in China. And so spent a lot of time out in those countries, kind of building out some of our programs, working with Mercedes-Benz in some of those countries as well. And then um, 
with the Hong Kong Sevens quite closely on becoming a charity partner for them. So, were you based in Asia at that time, or you've kind of gone back and forth, flying back and forth from, from the UK? Back and forth, yeah. I did. I did a four month stint in Beijing, which was a really eye opening experience. But again, a totally different culture and, and, and way of living. I did a a couple of months in Kuala Lumpur, but no, I spent my carbon footprint was, wasn't particularly good. I think I was flying back and forth every, every couple of months, really, to back to Asia, to different parts of the continent, just to, to or East Asia, to, to work on some of this work and these programs. It must be a brilliant experience, and I guess all of that stands you in good stead for your roles moving forward. I know from Laureus, you moved on to Arsenal Foundation, I'd say, at that time. Um, yeah, Kind absolutely. of moved full circle, really, isn't it, you, from, the, from the first so, uh, gap year? Totally, yeah, it was... Um, you know, I saw as I'd been there eight years, was kind of ready for a bit of a bit of a change and, and fancied something different. Didn't really know where, but yeah, saw on a, I think it was on LinkedIn that they were advertising for an Arsenal Foundation director. And it had been something in the back of my mind that I knew that they didn't have anyone full time working on the foundation at the at the time. So maybe at some point a, a job might pop up and it just so happened that it that it did. And I, I applied for it and yeah, they they offered me the job in um was it twenty twenty eighteen, I think. That's the, and then, so that was for as as director of the foundation, right? So you as director of the foundation, yeah. yeah. So the foundation yeah. had been up and running I think, since 2012, and on the basically people within the club running it on the side of their really busy jobs already. So Svenja Gasmar, who um, is the chief legal counsel of the, of the club, and then Kate Laurent, who's head of comms from uh, internal communications, particularly, were basically doing it on the side of their really busy jobs already, and have managed to get it to a to a really strong point. I'd say that's, it, impre- that's impressive given the scale of the foundation, all the programs. Is, um... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Arsenal, the community existed and that's a slightly separate thing to the foundation. So the community department have been up and running since the mid 80s. I think it was one of the first clubs to, to have that. And they've been doing a huge amount of work you know, in the local community and that continued, but they they weren't actually a charity. So they're actually a department of the, of the club. So whereas a lot of clubs, their foundation would kind of actually be that community work that takes place. Oh, okay, right, understood, understood. Yeah, so the foundation was set up as a, as a grant giver, basically. So to support local uh, local charities and then um, also some international kind of work and charities as well, particularly with, with Save the Children. Okay, good. So this is kind of almost like the CSR arm for Arsenal, for the club, as opposed to the community delivery being the... Arsenal in the community. Section. Yeah, exactly. So that, that's exactly right. Yeah. So more of a kind of grant giving side, I guess, which is kind of similar to what I've been doing at, at Loris, really. But they they hadn't really they had a clear direction of what they wanted, but not not really had a strategy before. And at the same time, they a written sort of a written strategy. And at the same time, they were starting a big program with Save the Children, which was actually kind of taking that expertise from Arsenal in the community and all the work they've done in North London, joining that together with with Save the Children's expertise around child trauma, basically, and creating a kind of football program that would help build the resilience of, of young people who were in the Zatari refugee camp in, in Jordan, sort of Syrian refugee camp, and then also the slum communities of, of Jakarta and Indonesia and kind of testing that and getting that up and running into those two locations really to see that, how, how that would work and then how how that partnership could come together to really impact them, those different communities. Yeah, I mean, how did that how did that translate then, taking the programme from... So I know it's not it's not going to be a carbon copy. You're going to be sensitive to the local local communities, but yeah, was that yeah? I guess was that successful or did you any lessons learned? Yeah, I mean it was challenging, definitely. You know, two very very different ways of of working again, two totally different cops, two totally different scenarios. You know, you have one that is a forced issue through war and conflicts basically that's resulted in these these people having to leave their homes and end up in this kind of informal camp, even though the camp had. had for about five years so it had a pretty good structure to it and then the, the Jakarta was a long-term history of deprivation basically within the slum community so found you know repetitive cycles of, of poverty and, and really generational so very kind of different scenarios but I think you know what was clear and what I've seen you know throughout my career is, is and I'm sure you've heard from all the people who've, who've spoken to is that sport has that translation to be able to work across all kinds of different scenarios and different settings and this program was was, was no different from uh, in that case really yeah for sure i guess even the badge as well arsenal fan base and yeah Asia exactly. must be huge as well so you can um rather if it, i guess it was if it was any other type of organization it might not have as, as good of a recognition that epl and, and, and arsenal as a club can, yeah, can bring and that was you know and that was one of the great advantages of working with save the children who are you know, such an established charity, you know, they had long term connections in both those countries, they really know the situation, knew the situation incredibly well in both 
in both countries and both settings. And so, you know, we really lent on them to help us in terms of it was a partnership. So we were working together to to really create this coaching for life program to to make it as have the a bit deeper impact as possible in both those in both those different settings. No, so I mean it, talking about profile probably leads us leads us on well to, to NFL. There's not many other global brands or brands with such a pull as NFL. So I mean it'd be good to kind of dive into exactly the, the role and things like that. But in terms of the decision to move, I guess it might have been a, a bit of a retro you being a being an Arsenal fan and, and, and maybe finding could be seen as that would be your dream job or forever <laughs> forever home essentially. But yeah, I mean in terms of your pull towards the NFL, you, you always have an interest in American football or is it more about what the potential of that role? Yeah, I mean I had, had an interest as a as a sports fan, you know, I'd watch the Super Bowl and, and things, but I wasn't uh, stayed up stayed up on the Sunday nights, yes. Yeah, yeah, but I was I was never really a kind of avid week in, week out NFL fan, I don't think. But I think the thing that really, really attracted me was was the idea that the, the UK office wanted to move beyond just hosting games in, in London. So they'd had games for, you know, since 2007, that was a pretty established part. I was going to say it's well established, right? And it, so is it two games at the moment? Two games a year at the moment? Or uh, so recent? we had 2019. We had four games, so it's kind of slowly growing. We, we're having two this year just because of uncertainties with COVID and things. But the hope is to we get can get back to to four games again, pretty because pretty this is this is going over to. Um... The other half of North London, obviously. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so two games over at Tottenham's ground and two at Wembley. Yeah. So. Great. yeah, exactly. So they, they've become pretty established events within the kind of sporting landscape, I guess, in the UK. But I think there was a focus and there, there had already been a bit of a shift in, in this direction anyway, but we needed to become more of a year-round business outside of when the games are in the UK. And so, and kind of giving back and community is a very ingrained part of the NFL in, in the US. So how can we kind of take the learnings from all the work that has happened over in the States? And as we have a 10-year partnership with, with Tottenham, so we know we're going to be in, in London for in the UK for a long time to come. So how can we actually start to build those long-term community platforms, I guess, and structures that will allow us to make the most of our kind of ever-growing platform in the UK, make help make us the kind of year-round, more of a year-round business and actually create kind of significant positive change through our sports and that be a central part of the business, which was, I guess, slightly different, obviously the case of Loris, but at Arsenal, massively important part of the club and the DNA, but still kind of the focus of the organisation is obviously winning, winning games and, and football matches. And so I think the thing that really excited me and appealed to me was, and how I see social responsibility is it's it's not just something that's it's, it's important that people do it and it's but it's not just a tick box thing it, not that it was a tick box thing at Arsenal but it's not just something that's there it actually should be and can be in a really effective way of progressing a business in terms of all their wider objectives around commercial around engaging with their supporters or fans marketing across the whole spectrum of the business and actually if, it can be, if it's done right it can be a really strong way of actually achieving all those wider goals as well as effectively using your platform to, to make a social impact as well yeah for sure i think it just kind of underpins all that authenticity if, you, if you're out in the community and you're working hard to support it I, i'm really interested in terms of what the u.s programs look like i know you've got a strong history of outreach in the u.s i mean what from your um experience i guess what does that look like in the u.s versus the uk or a bit of a knowledge gap for myself in terms of our community delivery in in the u.s so i don't know if you've got any insights yeah absolutely i mean i guess the, the easiest comparison is with the premier league here so the nfl in the us the league has kind of a central pot of funds that are provided through you know broadcast commercial deals and so forth and then there's kind of a variety of initiatives that we as a league come up with but then a lot of that delivery actually takes place through the different clubs across the country so the clubs will have their own kind of community departments and, and teams and charities which will deliver a lot of the a lot of the work on the ground so as a league we don't do a huge amount of delivery across the US. It's more around transferring grants and funding to the different clubs and different charities in the US. So, yeah, so really different. like a really similar setup to kind of Premier League Charitable Foundation. Yeah, and, exactly. Right. It's, it's really similar. Yeah, very, very similar in terms of how it works. And so for us, it's slightly different because obviously we don't have a club here in, in the UK. And so actually, in some ways, we're a bit of a hybrid between the league and the club in terms of the initiative. That is one of my questions. So is that you don't have a club in the UK? As of yet, or is that is that kind of the end game? Is that is that to have a, an NFL team in based in the UK, or is it more just raising profile and maybe the Super Bowl comes here in a few years' time? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think 
the, the thing, one of the reasons we're here is that to make the UK market a franchise ready market in case a team did want to come over here. I mean, I think we've got a lot of the things in, in place. If, if an owner wanted to bring a team here, we have a stadium now with, with Spurs, which is which is state of the art and, and, and world class. We have commercial partners. We have a Sky Sports NFL channel now that runs through the season. We have ticketing and all that sort of structure is in place and now we have all this community work that's in that's in place as well so i guess we're franchise ready but it's up to a, it would be up to an individual owner to decide whether they wanted to move a team over here but our main target is growing the sport and having more people showcasing the excitement and the thrills of it and hopefully through this work engaging a lot of young people who we believe that we can impact through the sport and our initiatives Definitely. So any billionaires listening, they might want to, they know that we've already packaged it up for them. In terms of the outreach initiatives, it'd be good to kind of drill down a little bit into, into that. So I know the NFL Academy is a big driver for you at the moment. So is it, I guess it'd be good to hear you maybe just expand a little bit on that and what, what the Academy is all about. Yeah, sure. So I guess the easiest comparison to the Academy is it sort of replicates the high school American football program in the, in the US. So it's based at Barnet and Southgate College, which is a further education college in, in North London. We have 85 young men at the moment only, but the hope is to open that up more widely in the, in the future, who have shown talent either in American football or in other sports or, or just general athleticism. And those young people come, those 85 are, are taking part in a kind of full-time kind of academy setting. But what's, I guess, different to your kind of rugby or, or maybe Premier League academies is just a key part of the sport, I guess, is if you want to progress as an athlete in American football, you need to have your academics in the right place. You need to have a strong kind of academic level to be able to be accepted into, into university. So that is a real incentive of it. So that the students do three practices a week. They do strength and conditioning. We have a gym on site at the, at the school as well, which is actually the gym that the teams use when they, or the equipment, this is the stuff, the equipment that the teams use when they come over for the for the game. So it's really high quality stuff. So they're doing that, but at the same time, they're doing their A-levels or BTECs or, or whatever kind of qualification that they're, that they want to do. If they don't turn up to class, they don't practice. If they, you know, if they want to pursue this as a career and, and get recruited by US colleges, you know, you need to have a certain grade point average. You know, you need to be attending classes and you need to be doing pretty well your exams i'm sure people have seen the kind of last chance you type documentaries and things on on netflix which really showcases that that side of it but it's, it's absolutely true and then alongside that we um we run a character development session every week which is teaching them working with them around developing their life skills themselves as young people outside of the, the classroom and off the field talk around sort of issues around social justice and sort of future pathways i guess but we know that 25 percent of the students wouldn't have continued in education if, if it wasn't for the academy um and so it's although there's a kind of key sporting element and we are creating young athletes the reality is that for the majority of those young people they won't have that opportunity to pursue their pursue you know an American football as a career so what is the platform that we can put in place for them to go on and achieve exciting happy lives whatever it is that they want to do whether that's further education here or kind of entering the world of employment helping give them that that platform to really take ownership of their futures and come out of it having had an amazing experience and be really excited about their future prospects. Yeah, it's, I mean, it sounds like a fantastic opportunity, especially with two moving to four games and they, they see all these teams coming in as well at the same time. That enrichment is kind of, I guess, un, unparalleled. Where where are the students, I guess, attending from? Are they all over the UK or predominantly London-based? Yeah, or are you recruiting from? Is it because it's residential? Is it at the, at the school? Or? Uh, no, so, so they have homestays. We have homestay kind of partnerships with with local families and things oh, um, in North London but yeah it's I mean it's a, about as a diverse a group as you as you can get you've got young people from kind of more, more challenged backgrounds in in London compared with young people who've been through a, a rugby academy in in Wales to an Estonian who played American football in Estonia who, uh, who applied wanted to come and take part so we have a few kind of European students who are involved as well so it's you know I think about 50% are based from London Forty-five percent from different parts of the UK, all regions kind of represented, and then five percent or so from kind of other other European countries. Yeah, so great spread. It probably reflects your kind of the the, the draw of the NFL, I suppose. All students in from all over the place. For you, what kind of I know there's the drivers behind all the community the uh, community programs, but in terms of challenges for yourself, in terms of promotion of NFL, obviously we're a football nation or a soccer nation, if the if American, yeah. American friends would would refer to it as. Is that a difficulty at the moment then? Obviously, it's going to be a challenge promoting NFL in a, in a footballing country, I suppose. In some ways it is because there's so many established sports here in, in the UK, you know, and we are a pretty new sport. But at the same time, I think there is, people are always looking for something new and something different. And I think 
the fact that we are, you know, we're not going to appeal to everyone, but I think there are different, well, we've seen from the work that we've done, you know, our community, some of the community programs we've run and things that we do seem to have a real connection with different, what well, we, we have a connection with different young people. You know, maybe they've tried other sports or tried other things and they've not really been the thing that's, that's done it for them, but particularly our, the flag version of our sport, which is kind of, I guess, sort of a tag rugby equivalent. So you don't need all the helmets and pads it can be played in sort of five-a-side sort of football pitch. This is equipment boys and girls can play together. You can have the music blaring and all that, all that sort of stuff at the at the same time. And the sort of, I guess, the American sort of entertainment side through the sort of, you know, the excitement, the razzmatazz of the sort of US element, as well as kind of cultural side through Madden on the PlayStation and, and Xbox, you know, sort of the gaming side of things kind of comes together to be quite appealing to different young people. When they try it for the first time, it seems to be something that people want to keep coming, coming back and back for and, and keep wanting to get involved in. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that flag football, for sure, is a really great fit for a primary school activity, primary school PE yeah. activity, after school activity, those type of things. Like I said, brings everyone together, so it doesn't matter what gender you are, etc. You can all, all join in, teachers included. That's great. In terms of your operational challenges, this is more about you and, and what you're doing on a day-to-day basis. Do you have kind of recurring challenges? Obviously, as, in a leadership position, everyone does, but... Are you able to give us a bit of an insight into what that looks like? Is it kind of culture clashes? Are you speaking to your American partners and in the UK? Do they have a different perception of, of how things should be done? Or are you kind of autonomous over here to do what? Yeah, it's, it's, we, we, we're fairly autonomous, but at the same time, we obviously want to you know, lean on the learnings and the work that, that's been done sort of domestically in the US as well. So I think Alistair Kirkwood, our, our managing director who, who just recently left, it always sort of described us as a bit of an adolescent that we kind of want to go off and do our own thing, but we also need to like lean on our parents a little bit as well at, at, the, at the same time. And so we do have quite a lot of autonomy. And I think that's one of the things that's been a real challenge. I mean, COVID has obviously been a big, big challenge for everyone, but I think we're trying to build strong, you know, really strong relationships with our social responsibility team in the, in the US and our leaders there, the clubs who are coming over just internally as well as we develop new initiatives and, and things. It's obviously much easier to be able to do that in person. You know, we would have more trips to the US, I'm, I'm sure, to meet people in person just internally as we develop these initiatives and things. And obviously, you know, sport has been, youth sport has been massively impacted by the pandemic in terms of ability to actually get out and play. And so there's been a lot of circumstantial things that, through the pandemic that have, that have have made it more challenging but then at the same time I think we've had more time to develop yeah. these and we've that has helped us I think if we had launched some of the we're, we're launching some, some exciting things in the next couple of months which are, unfortunately I can't dive into now but would love to come back and talk about it at some point but it's given us more time to get those right I think and get them in a better position which if we launched them last summer for example I think we're in a much better place with them with them now compared to where we would be before and, and we've also been able to take stock of a lot of the social social situations and events that have happened over the last over the last 12 to 18 months as well which will all play a part in what we want to do yeah for sure i mean nfl wise and, and i guess it, over the pandemic it's been a, a big focus or a shift towards kind of understanding and and the uh, the black lives matter movement etc and we've got now kind of taking the knees kind of mainstream but it's across all the leagues especially premier leagues will be on and, and that's all all starting out the us all starting in in, in the nfl so i suppose it, that always just draw attention to to the sport and uh, the one thing i was going to mention is i guess when you're talking about autonomy i get you always got it was interesting that we said lean, leaning on the on the kind of parents i guess people in the uk are drawn to the nfl because it is american rather than mm. it be so yeah you can't really not going to come, go too far away from that right i think to some extent but i think one of the one of the reasons we started the academy or the academy was started was also because there's a recognition of a, of a need to have those local role models and local connections so People need to have something that they can relate to to get excited about something. And, and maybe sometimes it's a bit more challenging to relate to an American player or superstar, you know, in terms of in terms of some athletes we have over there who are, who are incredible. But maybe you need that British player or young person at the academy whose story you kind of get excited about and want to follow to maybe just unlock that door for you a little bit to then have your eyes open to all the different elements and things that, that come through the sport. So I think the academy is, is very much a, a way for us to connect more, particularly with the youth with the youth audience very much a lot of the content's led by the students themselves and who kind of feature in it as well and so you know that's a really important thing for us I think we need to have that real British 
element to it for it to be as successful as it can be. Here we need, and, and for us in terms of community work, we can't, there's challenges in the US. The US is an enormous country. There's a massive diversity of challenges across the board in, in the US, and that's the same here in the UK. So we can't just adapt something that's that's worked in the US and bring it, bring it straight over here. We need to very much be clear in the kind of challenges that communities and, and people are facing here through coming out of the pandemic, which has only ex exacerbated a lot of those challenges, and make sure that we're working with community leaders and community organizations in, in each of these parts of the country who can help us get it right and actually make sure that we're developing something that will have an impact rather than just a sticker that we can kind of put on and, and say we're doing social impact. It's a, I'm just really curious, I know you've worked across so many different territories in, in other roles and obviously now back in the UK. What would you, if you're looking back, what's been like the most, I suppose, the most enjoyable country to work in? or And also, did you have probably the most difficult to get the job done in, if I was The difficult one's easiest to answer. China <laughs> is, is a really totally different way of of culture way of working you know that would be the the more the more diff, the most difficult place i mean extremely that's, rewarding so that's not and just fascinating, the, but in china sorry that's not just obviously language barrier but culturally is it just it just yeah them totally differently yeah. i mean the language is, is difficult i mean i don't speak i picked up a few bits but i don't speak mandarin uh, there's a not a huge amount of there's obviously some english in the sort of more leadership positions i guess but less so in the kind of uh, in other positions and so just simple things like when i was living when i was out there for a few months getting a taxi is a real is a real challenge you have to write down the address of where you want to go to or get someone at the hotel or front desk to write down where you want to go to in, in, in mandarin so that they take you to the to the, your meeting or to where you're where you're trying to go so there's a there's a whole t totally different way of working out i remember around the awards in shanghai we were doing a, a football event at a, at a local school we had some of our kind of football ambassadors who were planning to get involved and not Normally, that would be quite a, you know, if we were doing it in London, it'd be a really simple thing. We would work with the local organisation and, and it would, wouldn't take a whole lot of planning. It would take planning, but not a whole lot. But we have, were having kind of three, four hour meetings with the with the Shanghai government around putting on this type of event. And you have each department would have a turn to kind of say communications department, the transport department, security department would each take it in turns to kind of go through from start to finish their questions and concerns. All of this has to be translated in a, or sat in a kind of the big kind of conference room, I guess, with a translator speaking into, into a microphone. And that would just been most of my work had been very much kind of community based working with community yeah, organizations hit, hit the ground running kind of get it done so, yeah. yeah so i mean that was just a totally different different way of working which was fascinating but really challenging as well at, at the same time and if you're going to look at the i guess the most enjoyable there's so many to choose from but maybe something that stands out highlight stands out maybe a project that you've, you've worked on or, or just somewhere that a country that you worked in yeah i think i loved working um in Zatari, in the refugee camp with Arsenal, it's a fascinating place. You know, the people, the, the Syrian people there were so welcoming to us, so excited about the opportunity for, for their kids. I think they'd really seen the impact that the war had had. I mean, these, some of these kids were, they'd seen bombings, they'd seen relatives die they'd have to you know find their way out of the country to the to these refugee camps the refugee camps were pretty low quality in terms of the infrastructure they had around them there were tents it's pretty cold in that part of the jordanian desert in the winter there's snow sometimes and just i think the fact that we were coming in and creating something that would help the, their kids even though the parents had obviously been through similar traumatic experiences but have something that meant that these young people could all be kids they could run around and play football and kind of having parents tell us there's a lot of around sort of, it's not just football there's a lot packaged into it around understanding your emotions resilience a whole range of different kind of, sort of trauma management sort of tools i guess which come from safer children but having a parent say that their kid hadn't really spoken for four years and hadn't made any friends to suddenly that they've taken part in a couple of football sessions and and their eyes are opening up they're looking you in the eye they're you know they're making friends that they're playing with was very very impactful i guess in terms of that program so i mean there's, there's a whole lot to choose from but that's one that kind of stands out probably if you ask me tomorrow i'd, I'd say something different but that's one that is pretty powerful kind of i come back yeah. to it what, pulling all these experiences together have you, have you kind of developed i'm sure you have it's, it's definitely would have impacted you but in terms of your way of working and, and leadership do you have anything that you kind of that you always pull on in terms of your first thought when you're when you're leading or, or certain strategy yeah i think i think a lot of it is just li is listening is like is understanding, talking to people, hearing their point of view, listening to perspectives on things. I think, you know, if you 
go into a, a country you know nothing about and just stomp around and say this is how things should be done you're not going to get very far so you need to understand you need to challenges the things that work well the things that don't work well and I think I like to think I working very collaboratively very much in partnership you know those types of things are definitely things that I think have come from the experiences that I've had and I think I see as, as really important in terms of the way that, that I like to work anyway. Yeah I mean looking we always try to look forward as well in terms of 10-year vision we spoke about it quite a lot with, with the NFL. I'm interested in since you got into um, into the industry, what's been the, like I guess the major changes or the distance travelled from how things were done back then to now? Do you see a what? Do you see a big difference or, or, or kind of a trend of, of what's? Yeah, I think that there's still there's still a way to go, but I think when I started, it was very much the sport for development community was speaking to itself and not that many people were listening. And I think that has definitely been something that's started to change that commercially businesses are understanding that it's important. It's not just a tick box and it's actually something that should be, if it's done in an authentic way and in a, in a well thought about way, it can actually be something that really develops and advances advances the business and offers a whole new way of engaging audiences and, and partners and so I think that that shift has started to happen I think coming out of COVID will be really fascinating to see if that has an uh, additional boost I think after the financial crisis in 2008 there was a bigger focus on businesses having social responsibility they may not have gotten right but at least there were things that were happening and I think yeah. now the need you know with Black Lives Matter with you know all the events of the last 18 months to for things to be authentic to things to have a proper purpose for them to actually there's a real need for these things to happen it's not just a nice to have there's an actual fundamental need for this type of work to take place for our business to be successful I think over the next 10 years will be really interesting to see how that develops and, and how that continues to grow. Also just a couple of personal questions for myself do you have I mean obviously a leading uh, and you have done leading global organizations you're traveling etc what do you put in place to kind of keep yourself on top form I know it's, it probably would be sleep I know you're struggling with that at the moment but yeah do you have anything that you in terms of a routine things that you always that kind of your core to your routine things you always hang kind of lean on when uh to, to get you through or to keep you at top performance yeah I mean new, newborn baby is is definitely not not the easiest thing for um for that but I still play football every Thursday night with guys I grew up playing football with at school it's a nice it's a really good time to come back together and and just relax and talk talk the nonsense that we've been talking about for the last 20 years I think things like that help you know just just being able to relax and 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 you know particularly play football is, is the biggest for me is my biggest sort of stress relief for I think and that's been something that I've really struggled with with COVID with the leagues by side league got, got cancelled and things like that and I think that social element of, of seeing seeing you know friends and, and things is something that I really struggled with so I think just that ability to switch off you know definitely now start the fatherhood journey will be interesting to see how that kind of comes into it as well but my wife's really good at, at making sure I'm not getting too too distracted with other with other things particularly when I'm about to travel so I think just having those connections and having that base is, is the thing that I always come back to and that ability to get out and kick a, kick a football around will always be something I uh, yeah will have I think love that so last question for me and it's a bit of a reflective one so if, if you look back on your career and, and, and where you are to this point who have you had to become to be the leader you are today if that makes sense so start from when you started out your, your career to now leading setting strategy etc who's will had to become to be successful in your role at the moment yeah it's a really good question I think adaptable is definitely something and and things particularly when you're working in, in different countries that you're not as familiar with or even just entering a new business for to start that you'll have pre condition ideas of you how you think things will happen and how you think they'll work and you'll just turn up and that'll be really easy and not a problem we'll, we'll get that done and it shouldn't be too much hard work whereas actually there's all kinds of different things that you haven't, haven't thought about challenges that be thrown your way curveballs all that sort of stuff you'll need to put into um you know to the what the final package and product looks like I guess so I think there's that that adaptability and ability to try and not I like Sean Fitzpatrick and the All Blacks the you know, Sean was and uh, the academy and talks a lot about how the All Blacks have a no dickheads rule and I think just trying to do that whilst being a reasonably nice person and trying to build friendships and, and partnerships along the way is definitely the thing that I try to do and I think that's helped with all the, you know, the lot of relationships I have in different different places and with former colleagues and former the places that I worked I like to think that you know I could go back there and and send someone a text and and have a drink or have a chat and you know there'd be lots of those opportunities out there so I think that adaptability and at the same time trying to be relative keep relaxed keep a smile on your face and, and build relationships along the way I guess would be would be the answer for that one 
I appreciate that. Well, thanks so much for your time. And I know you're so busy. Um, what we'll do is link as much as we can into the show notes, including those uh, those All Blacks. I think, was it the All Blacks values, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's number yeah, one exactly. value, yeah. Was it 13 or something? But no, really appreciate you coming on. And hopefully when we um, we speak again, we'll, we'll have some more updates and, and uh, see how the land lies with the NFL in the UK. Yeah, thanks, James. Really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this week's show. You can subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can write to us at dryphase.podcast at coordinate.cloud, tweet us at coordinate sport, or follow us on Instagram at coordinate underscore sports, or on my account at james underscore ventures. This episode was produced by Nancy Kwamboka, with support from Claire Goodchild and Lola Small, with special thanks to Rochelle. I'm James Moore, and you've been listening to The Drive Phase from Coordinate Sport.